Hello and welcome to Lean4 Podcast. Uh, today we have got Dan, who is a nutritionist specialist. Dan, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you, Sal? Yeah, very good. So Dan, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, certainly. So I'm Dan Richardson. I'm a performance nutritionist. Uh, I kind of, I suppose, started this journey as a sports scientist uh, when I was studying at Durham University. So I went on and studied all kind of different disciplines around, you know, um, physiology, uh, biomechanics and nutrition was one of those sections that I really kind of honed in on. And then from there, I went on to um, go and study a master's degree um, in sports nutrition itself. So really kind of found that topic of study quite interesting and quite relevant, um, you know, in the current industry, which I'm sure we're going to tap into a little bit more around swimming um, to, yeah. in today's podcast, but really kind of interests me across all sports. Um, I was a rugby player uh, at once upon a time, never quite a swimmer, uh, probably a bit too short for that and a bit too heavy. Uh, didn't quite float like I see the swimmers do that I work with. Uh, but that led me to work in loads of different sports. Started out in rugby, a little bit of football. Have worked with a few swimming teams, a few of the local clubs, um, and a few kind of uh, swimmers along the way, alongside working with many different athletes. You know, in that kind of, I suppose, Olympic setting as well. Um, you know, tailoring and and you know, gearing up towards those kind of Olympic success and supporting those athletes. Well, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Thank you. So, um. We're going to start off by talking about some, you know, supplements, just going on mainly about swimmers and young swimmers in general under 18s. So if you could have uh, three supplements you would recommend, what were, what would be the top of your list? What would you recommend for swimmers in general or sportsmen? Yeah, I think it's quite difficult sometimes to, you know, subjectively or objectively, I suppose, recommend supplements straight off the bat. But there is some that I suppose for swimmers are more specific than other sports. And I love how, you know, you're sipping on the SIS uh, water bottle there, just getting a quick of kind of, yeah, branding supplement straight in there with the question. Yeah, there we go. Um, but in terms of top three, I think we've got to focus on, um, you know, actionable and achievable kind of, you know, scenarios for a swimmer, you know, without knowing the swimmers that are watching this podcast and understanding some of their potential nutrient deficiencies, I suppose, where we'd look to supplement. I think the important areas that we need to look at as swimmers is maintaining health and performance. So first of all, and the first thing I'd always recommend to all athletes to work with, not just swimmers, um, is vitamin D. And the reason why we need vitamin D is because typically around 80% of our vitamin D stores that we actually generate from uh, from our kind of sources externally from the body comes from sunlight. And, you know, yes, granted, it is a little bit sunny outside today where I am and it doesn't look too bad yeah. where you are. 90% of the time, if you live in a country like the UK, we're not going to get our uh, daily vitamin D dose in. And, you know, I'm sat here today in a hoodie um, and some joggers. And, I'm, you know, realistically, the only part of my skin that's absorbing vitamin D am I excellent in terms of supporting a swimmer. That would kind of be my number one in terms of supporting overall health. I think the second one and probably one that isn't necessarily a supplement or can be considered a supplement is some form of sports drink when it comes to, you know, taking part in longer duration sessions. So anything over 60 minutes, you know, teetering on the 90 minutes in the pool or potentially at a gala um, or a swimming competition where we're going to have multiple back to back races. And the focus has to be on getting not just kind of energy from our food sources because it's been quite tricky, especially if we're spending a lot of time in the pool and also potentially coupling that up with some land training as well. We might want to look towards a form of liquid energy, which I'd say, you know, your classic Lucasades, Gatorades, potentially some form of SIS, you know, go electrolyte yeah. or carb powder that's going to give us additional carbs to support our fueling and performance. And then I think, I suppose, final one, I'm trying to make sure that I'm thinking of ones that aren't your classic kind of creatine caffeine. Yeah because again can be quite subjective because you know i'm sat here sipping on a coffee which is technically a supplement and a caffeine uh, based product but it's not like a caffeine gel etc so yeah. i think the, the final one that i suppose i'd look towards that i'd say all swimmers should kind of have in their bags um, and make sure that they've got available is you know alongside potentially um you know having lucas aids or sports drinks over a 60 minute session is potentially energy gels when it comes to those longer duration races mm -hmm potentially long format competitions again just to kind of give us that replacement of quick sugary carbs to be able to support our energy so i think quick roundup of those three yeah. is D, uh, carbohydrate uh, based kind of drink and then a carb based gel is probably the best three i can recommend yeah because obviously that was quite a hard question to be fair because it's very subjective to a, the swimmer the build everything yeah. there's a lot of things around it isn't it you can't really just say a general three so 
with you know monitoring calories and that kind of thing because i think a lot of people especially in my age group and that kind of thing get very obsessed with calories and that kind of thing with looking like all you see these these influencers and all of that with these absolutely amazing bodies and people get very obsessed with it do you think athletes should try and monitor their macros very closely or do you think you know it's not a healthy thing to do i think there's there's elements to it so realistically if we're finding that we're having a negative effect on our performance from not monitoring our intake such as higher injury risk potentially low energy levels tiredness and fatigue then yes we should probably have a look a little bit more closely towards what we're consuming and ensure that it's the right types of foods and the volume of food that we need for our performance but realistically for most athletes and especially swimmers I think we need to take an intuitive eating approach which essentially means we listen to the body if we're hungry and we know we need to fuel up then we're going to add more carbs into the body if we're recovering we're going to focus more on fruit and veg with a nice little hit of protein to help with that recovery but realistically we shouldn't really be feeling hungry as an athlete I think one of the biggest downsides to being an athlete is you often feel hungry all the all of the time and I find that a lot of the swimmers that I work with so it's eating foods that are highly satiating so you know not looking towards those fast acting sugars all the time and looking towards more kind of carby long chain and and starchy products that are going to give us that energy over a long period of time and I think you know you mentioned there about like should we closely monitor our macros like yes we should be understandable that more carbs pre-training is going to give us more energy but that's about as far as I think we need to take it unless you're enlisting the help of a nutritionist that's kind of building those numbers and figures in there for you with a meal plan as opposed to kind of you know trying to guesswork or find out yourself just listen to your body and that's probably going to give you the best kind of scope to work with. Yeah, I agree with that. So that's, yeah, that's very interesting because obviously being at a school like this where we're boarding, it's very hard to probably get in those, like all the calories you probably need is the amount of exercise we do. So do you think protein shakes are a good alternate, like an alternate for, to increase protein intake? Or do you think that's a good thing? So another great question, um, really kind of throwing them throwing them at me today, which is brilliant. I really enjoy this. And I think it's True. good to kind of get these topics out in the open because, yeah, you know, a lot, uh, especially at schools, a lot of schools I work with are quite scared to talk about supplements and scared to talk about protein shakes and, you know, energy gels and all of that kind of stuff. When realistically, the form quite a big part of you know a youth development athlete when we're looking at swimmers that are still at school and looking to develop so you know I work with you know a few academies one being Leeds United's academy and um, you know mm-hmm. from a football perspective and you know realistically to be completely transparent from the age of kind of 16 upwards we look towards using protein shakes as a means to be able to get the recovery in following a game however during the week when we're just going on our day-to-day I suppose school and also training schedule they're looking to get protein from food sources as opposed to protein from um, shakes or recovery drinks so Mm-hmm. The reason for that, I suppose, is to look at it two ways. One is protein shakes can be convenient. So following a big swim or a big training session, especially if you're boarding at a school, it might be a case that you kind of struggle, I suppose, to be able to find that protein in a snack or, you know, potentially the catering services aren't offering, you know, kind of evening snacks that are high protein. Um, so you might need to opt for something a little bit additional, um, such as a shake or a bar, for example. Whereas mm-hmm. I think depending on the time of your training. So a lot of swimmers that I've worked with in the school and, you know, independent school setting actually have their swimming prior to breakfast being served. So realistically, yeah. in the pool. That's what we have, yeah. Yeah, so if you're in the pool and you're coming out of the pool and, you know, breakfast is there and ready to go, you should be able to get enough protein in from that breakfast that elicits muscle protein synthesis, which is essentially the regrowing and regeneration of muscles. And actually we only need around 20 to 40 grams of protein. So if you started adding milk, eggs, potentially some form of chicken sausage, um, you know, to keep it quite lean and healthy and maybe looking towards, you know, some form of, um, you know, additional protein source there without opting for a shake will actually prove to be much more beneficial because of the additional nutrients that are available. Um, So I think, yeah, to answer your question on that, I think, yes, for convenience, but I think also, you know, looking towards the food first approach where possible. And actually, sometimes I'm not too sure what it's like, you know, where yourselves are boarding, but actually, and, you know, the listeners that are listening to this podcast, but it might be that the school has a zero tolerance to supplements policy. Um, If that's the case, then we have to opt for those food sources at all times, which to be honest, isn't a bad thing. And actually it's providing you with more nutrients. 
Yeah, I think this is really good because I think it's answering a lot of questions that lots of kids my age are actually wondering. So it sort of leads on to my next question with, you know, eating breakfast after training. Is there certain times of the day when you should be eating? Because I know I've heard lots of things about how you shouldn't eat just before you're going to go to bed and lots of things like that. Like how many hours before or let's say after training should you be eating? Yeah, I think for swimmers, you know, keeping it relevant to the pod, it's very yeah. different because of the times that you train and realistically trying to get the ideal schedule, I suppose, of food consumption into your bodies when you're, um, you know, looking towards, um, you know, the, the optimal performance and the optimal kind of eating scale. It can be difficult. I think one of the big ones there is actually, you know, most swimmers, like you say, early in the morning, you're swimming. So actually quite late in the evening, you need to be consuming a lot of carbohydrates to give you the energy for the morning, because realistically that window of opportunity to eat before you swim is going to be limited to potentially like a bagel with some jam on it and a banana, for example, a very small kind of snack before. It's not going to be a full hearted breakfast of oats and all the rest of it, unless you're, you know, some one that can get up at 4 a.m. if you're swimming at six to allow yeah. the food to digest and you know name me one um you know one school level athlete that wants to get up at 4 a.m with the boarding yeah absolutely not so it's not going to be possible now for looking at key timings of when we should eat then you know following i suppose uh training if we can if training's a.m and we're early in the morning making sure that we get a large breakfast in and sometimes for swimmers that seems backwards because realistically they're looking at kind of like well i've already trained so why do i need to fuel up for the day but what you've got to imagine is if we're looking at energy balance most swimmers will step in the pool at a positive energy balance because they'll have had a bagel and maybe a banana or you know some sort of oat cakes as well you know just to give them some energy but once they finish training their energy uh, their energy intake stays here while they're expended to expenditures all the way up here so what we need to do is normalize that back and get the levels back and the only way we can regenerate you know, carbohydrates, glycogen, and all the rest of it is to actually have a good breakfast. So I think though a swimmer's breakfast might be after training or their main breakfast might be after training, it's important, especially if we've got back-to-back -back training sessions or maybe S&C later in the day, um, you know, or some land-based training, it might be that we're looking towards rebuilding and regrowing and repairing the body ready to go for that next session. So we always need to think as swimmers about being one session ahead, you know, realistically, yeah. A breakfast that we have after training isn't going to benefit you from the training that you've just had. It's looking towards the next day or, the, or that evening or even just getting through the school day, for example, if we're a school level athlete. So breakfast to me is probably the most important meal of the day when it comes to swimmers. And then we've got to follow that up with a good lunch and a good evening meal as well that's consistent in high protein, high carbs and realistically. Yeah looking at meals and foods swimmers are most likely going to eat more and i think one of the big things that i've i've found working with school level athletes especially in the boarding school setting is actually you're probably going to eat more than your peers that aren't swimmers and that's not a problem <laughs> It's not a case of, you know, that you need to be kind of worried about piling up your plate or having a few extra slices of bread on the side. Like, just remember, you're doing so much more physically demanding activity than some of your peers that are potentially, you know, going off and doing music in the evening instead of training, for example. They're burning a lot less energy than you are, meaning that we need to make sure that energy is going into the body or we, you know, suffer with potential issues of like a relative energy deficiency which is quite common in your know, school level athletes which is quite difficult to manage from a nutrition perspective because it's not just about increasing food intake it's about increasing nutrients that might be deficient so i suppose yeah breakfast is probably the key one but then look into yeah. the other things as well just to make sure that we're ticking the box every single meal that we get opportunity to eat yeah i think that's really helpful so at the moment we're just trying to think about trends and popularity so Intermittent fasting is massively popular at the moment. I think it's, it's always been for the last year or two. So yeah. What's your thoughts on this? Do you think there's lots of benefits to it? Or what well, for less, because I don't think as a swimmer, I, I wouldn't be able to intermediate fast. If I train in the morning, there's not a chance I'd wait a couple of hours before I can eat. But in general, do you think it's a good thing? So again, depends on your goals. Like intermittent fasting from a... I suppose a scientific research standpoint doesn't necessarily have um, any real benefits from what I can see in the research from a performance perspective. Now, but there might be some mental perspectives around that that I potentially brushed over, but from a physically performing point of view for an athlete, there's no real benefit to intermittent fasting. Like you said, as a swimmer, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually, um, you know, look towards intermittent fasting because 
realistically it's not going to be feasible and your training time switch so much there's no regular pattern now if you were somebody who needed to be in a calorie deficit to elicit you know a bit a little bit of fat loss or a little bit of weight loss then intermittent fasting is a nice set of rules that you can put in place for yourself that stops you eating at the wrong times of the day. So, for example, some people will intermittent fast, um, you know, from 8 p.m. at night. Realistically, most people, myself being guilty of it, is probably to, uh, probably tucking into the bag of chocolates around 8, 9 o'clock with a bit of Netflix or um, a little bit of whatever's on TV. So that kind of sets those ground rules to stop you from eating the junk that you normally would. And that's where intermittent fasting can be beneficial to some people. Now, for athletes that are looking to fast unless of course for religious reasons of which a nutritionist work around and i'd certainly recommend to anybody that is doing um you know a fast for any form of religious reasons to reach out to a nutritionist mm. for a little bit of support around that but realistically we're not going to see any benefits to performance realistically we're probably going to see some negatives and potential an increase in injury risk especially if our fast falls in the time of when we're supposed to be training so trying to avoid any form of fasting and always ensuring there's energy going into the body is really important for supporting an athlete like a swimmer who has so such yeah. a high training demand and a high load on the body. Yeah, because you're obviously burning a lot of calories, using a lot of energy. You don't want that to be too low. So gut health is also getting a lot of focus at the moment. What's your thoughts on that in yeah, general? Definitely. Really big, really big topic. And I think I saw a, a really good clip from uh, one of the kind of key researchers in the area of um, probiotics. Um and he was talking and addressing, I believe it was a club in, in rugby or football, um, but, you know, all applies the same when it comes to athletes and gut health. And he was saying he was he, he's kind of a gut health specialist. And he was saying to a um, nutritionist who was at this club who was saying like, oh, do you, you know, how many players do you have on probiotics? Um, you know, why do you want the guts assessing of all of your athletes? Do you find that you've got some gut issues within the players, within the squad? How many players have reported um, gut issues? And the nutritionist turned around and said, well, well none. Um, we've got no gut issues. And he, he kind of said, well, why are you trying to fix something that's not broken? And I think that's probably, you know, rule 101 with the gut is if, you have a good gut and you're able to train the gut for competition and training and allow for that increase in carbohydrates, which can potentially cause some discomfort to some or allow that increase in fats when we're looking at, you know, those higher intensity periods of time in training and performance, then, you know, realistically, if we're able to man that or manage that, sorry, we're able to kind of, you know, support ourselves um, as, uh, as athletes there. Now, the problems lie when we can't necessarily do that and our gut microbiome is slightly off. And I'm by no means an expert in this area, but obviously I work with it quite a bit when it comes to athletes. I think, you know, first of all, seeking kind of medical help and support if we are finding that we're having flare-ups of IBS with certain foods we're eating, there's a, a, a diet that most dietitians will put you on called FODMAP, which will kind of allow you to eliminate certain foods um, that might be causing flare-ups. But there are some key ones that you can go and Google, like onions, garlics, anything that's kind of potent like that can cause that problem. I think the, it kind of all boils back to that point of are probiotics really beneficial if there's no current gut issues with the body? If you've got enough mm. kind of, you've, you've got a good and healthy bacteria in the gut already, then, you know, why try and change that, you know, realistically good bacteria in the gut and a good balance of good and bad bacteria in the gut is going to maintain performance and help us perform at our absolute best. There is a lot of science that's now coming out, however, around kind of the gut brain axis and how our gut is actually connected um, by the vagus nerve to our brain, which essentially means that if our, we knew that it was always connected because realistically, the minute that your stomach's hungry, it doesn't just gurgle, but it also tells your brain that you need to eat some food and it makes you crave all the food in the world. But we'll, what we've managed to do, or what I said we as in nutritionists and, and experts yeah. in that field have managed to do, is connect up the um, the kind of, I suppose, the junk food model um, of, of food, which athletes find themselves binging sometimes without breaking into that too much. But realistically, athletes like to think that they can eat healthy 100% of the time. They then fall into a cycle of binge where, you know, two or three weeks in, they go and grab a Domino's and before they know it, they're tucking into a full tub of Ben & Jerry's, six pack of cookies, um, and you name it, the rest of it. And then they feel yeah. guilty, really strict again. And the reason why they keep doing that cycle quite often from a scientific perspective 
is all around the gut. So it takes roughly, as, as far as I'm aware from the research I've seen, around 72 hours to reset the gut. So what that means is if, you know, this evening you decided you were going to go get Domino's pizza with some of the other guys in the boarding house, not a problem because, you know, we're all about that kind of sustainability of diet, you know, having the good and having the bad in moderation. If you were to go and get Domino's tonight, your cravings for another junk based food would last for three days. So you need to be aware of that mentally to be able to overcome that from the gut to avoid that kind of connection to the brain telling you that you need to eat junk food again. That's why a lot of the, I suppose, the health based um, nutrition work that I do with, um, you know, gym goers and regular people that struggle to lose weight. A lot of it comes down to the weekend. You know, it's Saturday, mm -hmm. we're filming this on Saturday afternoon. Most of those clients would be wanting to go and have a takeaway or potentially go out for a meal. But then that leads to potentially, you know, the next day looking towards getting a takeaway and the next day after that. And until we break that cycle and stop the gut brain axis kind of interfering there with telling us that we need that junk food, it can be quite difficult. So I think, yeah, the gut is a very interesting topic at the minute in research. And I think, you know, gut microbiomes and healthy gut bacteria if it isn't broken, we don't need to fix it. And I think actually we can look at probiotics to improve the gut microbiome if required, but only, you know, after seeking support and health, we don't need to be throwing a million probiotics, a yakel and an active yeah. adapt every day to improve that live bacteria, because realistically we should be consuming that in our daily foods anyway. And then of course, like I say, that gut brain access is really important. Um, looking towards, you know, that kind of junk food mentality and breaking that binge cycle for us. Yeah, uh, yeah. To be fair, I even find that as like I definitely feel like I can go into that cycle very easily. So mm -hmm. moving on to hydration. So how much do you reckon? I know we're athletes, as you know, do a lot of exercise. But how much do you reckon we should be drinking a day? And what do you reckon the optimal amount of sleep is for especially athletes, but under eighteen more? Yeah, definitely. I think for swimmers specifically, it can be quite hard to work out how much you need to uh, consume in terms of water, because really I've done a bit of swimming in my time, not nowhere near yeah. competitive level when I was a lot younger. And you don't realize when you're in the pool surrounded by water that you're actually sweating, but you know, yeah. ultimately as disgusted as it sounds, every swimmer that's training and competing at that time is most likely sweating just as much as what they would as if they were in the gym, because there's a lot of moments in your training or competition where they're going to be high intensity. And, you know, I always, I always say to swimmers, like, just think about how much, um, I, you know, I'm doing a sprint, how much out of breath, um, you get from doing a specific sprint movement in the pool that's equivalent to doing you know a 100 meter sprint on a track and then stopping for a minute at the edge of the pool or the edge of the track and feeling how much sweat's coming off you that's exactly the same in the pool but we just don't realize it because we're already wet so the biggest yeah. problem I, think I find for hydration when it comes to um swimmers is actually understanding we need to hydrate though we're in the pool uh, for long periods of time because we are sweating we just don't see it because actually it goes straight into the water um, I think a little hydration tip that isn't necessarily nutritionally, um, I suppose, backed is probably the best word, is most swimmers, because you're swimming in water, drinking water is just not really a nice taste, you know, consistently. No, yeah. I same, you know, an electrolyte tablet or potentially just some like sugar-free um, squash or cordial in the bottom of, of one of your water bottles can always be beneficial just to refresh the taste in the mouth so you feel like you're getting hydrated. Probably more of a psychological effect as opposed to, a, you know, physiological effect there. If we're looking at kind of daily hydration, always recommending two to three liters a day, but then looking towards the specific training hydrations that we might need. So within that two to three liters, we might look to get maybe a liter of that in during training. We might look to maybe add an extra liter in when it comes to, um, you know, looking towards supporting our abilities to rehydrate correctly. The only way we can truly know our own hydration is either we go and get sweat testing done, which can be really expensive, or we just check our urine color. So, you know, as you know, as as swimmers, hoping that we're not um, urinating in the pool and we're getting out and going and, and not in the showers either, you know, checking sure. your, your urine color at post training. Once we finish training is always a good way to tell if we're mm -hmm. hydrated or not. If we're kind of, I suppose, that darker side of urine color, we want around 500 mil to one liter over the next half an hour to support hydration. And then we're trying to get back to that kind of near clear color. So we don't want our urine color to be completely translucent because that means we're slightly overhydrated. We want it to be pale is the best way of describing it. So the way you can work out, you know, anyone watching this, work out your hydration levels and what you require 
is actually to take a look, um, you know, like I say, at your urine colour. Obviously, still hit that two to three litres a day. But if you're a high sweater and you know that you are, it might be that you're on four, four and a half litres a day to make sure you're keeping up with hydration and looking towards having that hydration specifically around training to support the before training hydration and the post training rehydration, I think is really important. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I I feel like I so I'm like I feel like it's very easy to get dehydrated. Like I'll come out of a training session with quite a big headache because I just completely because you're sweating so much, you just don't feel like in the pool that you need to drink. It's quite a strange yeah. sensation. So you I think you've already touched on it a bit, but so what's your thoughts on cheat meals? Because obviously we've basically said with the gut health and all of that. But do you think it is a positive thing or do you think they should be stayed away from so like let's say if you've got your designated cheat cheat day on a sunday do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? i think the 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 big thing here is from the way a nutritionist looks at it and an athlete looks at it the the mindset is shifting now away from cheat days or cheat meals it's very you know um i suppose bodybuilder-esque to talk about a cheat meal in the week you know those that are cutting for a competition for example when it comes to bodybuilding might look towards having a cheat meal when their macros and calories are so strict and that's you know by no part an, an insult on that industry at all you know that's the way yeah to go about competition when it comes to bodybuilding or physique competitions because realistically the mind margins are so fine when we're looking at athletic i suppose quote-unquote cheat meals i think the importance is to remember that realistically if you're uh you know focusing on a cheat meal then you're effectively you know developing unhealthy habits when it comes to nutrition because you're not allowing the body or the yourself to roam freely around foods and then you start categorizing foods into healthy and unhealthy but we know even if you just look at the healthy eating plate from the government guidelines that you know you've got that 80 percent wheel in the middle and that's like you should eat off this plate 80 percent of the time and in the bottom corner there's those foods that are high in sugars and fats that's our 20 percent so realistically if we're looking for balance as an athlete we're looking for an 80 80 20 split so 80 percent of the time we're having all the best foods that we can possibly get when it comes to our nutrition and our performance 20 percent of the time we're looking towards those what i prefer to call fun foods not necessarily unhealthy foods because they're still important and healthy to a balanced nutritional plan so i think when we're looking at cheat meals and the best time to have them i think realistically for swimmers with how much energy burn there is we're looking potentially across a week or even, you know, across a day, having little and often kind of snacks and treats that kind of don't necessarily conform to the best performance. Now, that isn't to say that prior to training, we're going to have, you know, a triple stack of pancakes with loads of whipped cream, chocolate and all the rest of it, because that's not going to be beneficial to performance. But potentially that evening, if, you know, after we've eaten all of our food and we've had maybe a chocolate bar at lunch, or we might have had, you know, a, a can of Coca-Cola in the evening after training or whatever, it might be that in the evening we have um, a few waffles with a bit of maple syrup on it or something like that as a treat. Or, you know, especially at boarding schools, I've seen kind of quite a bit because I, I go into a lot of boarding schools and deliver nutritional talks that actually they'll have like, you know, waffles with a bit of cream um, and kind of, you know, a sprinkle of, um, you know, chocolate on there as well. Like that's fine to have the dessert um, in the evenings. It's not going to cause any problem. That's probably your 20%. I think my favorite one and those that are watching that are swimmers, um, you know, potentially pause the podcast and have a look and type in Michael Phelps, um, London 2012 Olympic diet. And you'll see on his diet and his food that he ate, ate on there. And I bring this up a lot in my presentations is actually in the, for his breakfast because of how much food he was eating. He'd have, you know, a bowl of oatmeal, um, fruit, mm. coffee and an omelet for breakfast, but then slap bang in the middle of the day, um, he'd have a massive meatball Subway sandwich. Like, do we consider that as unhealthy, a cheat meal? But he was having that daily. And I think at one point he was actually sponsored by Subway uh, to be able to do that. And then, you know, looking um, at his evening meal, it was like lean veggies, um, you know, whole grains and lo lots of uh, lean meat as well. So realistically sandwiched in, pardon the pun, a, a meatball Subway between a really good breakfast and a really good evening meal that supported him, you know, all the way through his, his career. And and you look at him as the most decorated Olympian, you know, of all times. Yeah. And you think a little bit that actually, if he can get away with doing that, 
swimmers certainly can. Yes, it's not the most healthy way of doing that every single day, but at least, you know, three out of seven or four out of seven days, having a meal or some snacks within there that is going to support us with our healthy, sustainable eating, I think is important. So having that cheap meal, yes, can be difficult to get in, but realistically, we want to try and not call it a cheap meal and just make it part of our sustainable diet. And, it's, you know, it's part of healthy eating, I think is the best kind of way to summarize that. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I agree with that. That's really, I think it's just very interesting to have that, like, not have the mentality that you can't have any bad food. I think a lot of people, they do this strict diet and then they fall into this cycle. I think it's very easy. So a very controversial in my mind, but it may not be to you. Creatine, I think lots and lots of people are talking about at the moment. And some coaches will say absolutely not for most under 18 swimmers. Some coaches think it's a great thing. What do you think on it? Because I've heard loads of things about how it does things to your kidney. And then you hear, you just hear so many sides of the story. What What's your thoughts about it? Yeah, I think it, it can be tough. So with creatine, two of the research myths, I suppose, just to debunk straight out there, is the kidney liver myth and the hair loss myth, which is another one. I'll tackle the hair loss one first and then go into the kidney and liver. Hair loss one, um, I can't quite remember the specifics of the study, which is probably helpful when we're going to debunk it. But realistically, it, the story goes, um, they were looking at the effects of creatine on male rugby players um, across a longitudinal period of time. I believe it was three or four seasons at that time. Male rugby players that were aged, let's go with a random age group of like 24 to 28. It was something along those lines in the 20s. They were looking at performance markers and observing these players. One of the observations that they took over the three years was a a, a hair loss or effectively a, I suppose, average over the squad, more hair loss, um, you know, at, the, at that age group because of they were taking crazy. And that's what they deducted from the study. But realistically, if you look at most males that are getting into kind of their, you know, mid to late 20s, they probably are balding a little bit. And rugby players, you know, more so than any others because they probably have, you know, higher testosterone, the way they train, the way they probably look after themselves as well. They're not really doing any hair care or skin care or looking yeah. to you know looking after the hair but realistically the the myth kind of grew that you know creatine causes hair loss similar with the kidneys and livers kind of research studies those studies were done in participants that already had underlying health conditions that exasperated liver and kidney issues so yes we know that the creatine does cause a little bit more strain on the liver and uh, sorry on the kidney because we need to consume more water during that period of time so to effectively we're over hydrating the body a little bit when we're having creatine because the nature of creatine it dehydrates us we need to have more create uh, more water in the body which puts a little bit more strain on the kidney to flush that water through and regenerate it that's what kind of that where those studies came from so both of them are kind of you know let's park them yeah. for now we don't need to worry about that the big area for me with younger athletes is the muscle cramping and um, the stomach cramps potentially, and also the dehydration effects of creatine of those under 16. So yes, there's a lot of performance benefits when it comes to creatine, but ultimately most six, under 16 year olds don't have enough muscle mass for the creatine that we're actually consuming, which means we have kind of that waste product to creatine in the body, which means that we're causing more dehydration. We're probably not consuming enough water, which is then causing muscle cramps. And then it can potentially cause stomach pains because it's not going to the, the muscles and the sites in the body where it needs to be. And it's sitting in the stomach. So I think any athletes that are under 16, we kind of want to avoid creatine because yes, it might not, it might not uh, feel like you're having any issues with that, but realistically and ultimately we could potentially be causing ourselves a detriment to performance, but not necessarily our health. So I think avoiding it until we're kind of 16 plus, ideally 18 is probably good. And if we do want to increase our creatine stores naturally through foods, a lot of meats and fish actually have a high content of creatine in. Granted, nowhere near as much as that kind of five gram scoop of creatine that you can get from a supplement. But again, your muscles aren't really big enough to be taken on board five grams per day, every day of creatine. So I think that's probably, like you say, quite a controversial topic because mm -hmm. I, I have to have a lot of debates with coaches actually, and especially in swimming around how, you know, until your athletes get to 16, 18, that's when we'd look at creatine. Don't try and give, you know, I've seen it as young in some clubs I've worked at as 12 year olds and that their parents trying to push creatine on them because again, ultimately they want them to be an Olympic swimmer Swimmer. that's the goal yeah. they want to compete on the world stage and the sooner they can start something they think the better it's going to be in the long run but realistically it's not going to be having a positive effect 
Yeah, agree. I think it's very it's very easy to be quite short sighted where you want that end goal, and I think it may. I think lots of people just go straight to it. Yeah, but um, well, thank you so much for this because I think there's so many other questions people want to ask you, and lots more questions I've got for you anyway. But we actually are running out of time, so we're going to have to call it a day there. But thank you so much; it's been incredible, and we'd love to have you on again to talk about a lot more things. Because when I discuss with some of my teammates and coaches and that kind of thing, they had questions they'd love to ask you. So I think there'd be um, another time where we'd have another quite long list of uh, questions to give you. Definitely. I think, you know, my Instagram's always open to questions. That's kind of how we connected, which is at DRN Nutrition. Um, so if you, anybody's got any questions that they want to ask directly to me, more than happy to answer on there. And I think as well, potentially we do a part two where we've got a little bit more time. What we can do is throw together kind of a big long list of Q&A and we'll go through them together. I think that'd be a really great Yeah, episode. that'd be a nice thing to do look towards the new year and get that in there. But I just want to say a massive thank you for having me on and hopefully it's been beneficial to those swimmers that are listening in today. Well, thank you so much. So for any more content, please go to at Lane4Podcast and see you next time. Thank you.